certainly what you ended with circles back to the question of trauma. Okay. Um, and uh, unfortunately, trauma is a, a consistent theme through all of white settler colonial history. Um, and so I think that's a linking theme that we have here um, that we need to contend with. Um, so uh, some of my thoughts uh, going to the first presentation, um, I love watching the, the development of your work. I saw it last year as well, and it's a really important theme. Um, there's just so much uh, importance to the work you're doing, and uh, one thought, uh, you know, a bunch of thoughts, let me throw these out. So uh, the relationship of the medical community as a whole to the black population in the United States is from. And uh, one of the books I use in one of my classes is uh, Medical Apartheid, I've come across it. It's a devastating 400 page uh, indictment of all of the racism that's come through the medical system. And so one of the conclusions of that book is that the, the so-called irrational fear of the black communities relation, in relation to the medical establishment is not irrational at all. Um, Dr. Washington basically points out in the book that it's a highly rational fear, and for people to call it irrational means they don't really understand. So there's like the trauma of the medical community, the, the fear of it, and the protection, and then that itself is stigmatized as yet another problem. So just in terms of framing, um, broadly, there's this huge history that's only being looked at a little bit right now. And then within that, with all these medical things, there's uh, a lot of stigma, not just in black communities, but in many oppressed communities, about getting therapy in general and dealing with mental health. Uh, and, and a lot of that, I think, comes from the fact that you have a history of, of uh, mental health uh, therapeutic uh, activity really coming from a, a bourgeois um, elite space, a white space. And um, so it's seen as sort of a bougie or a privileged thing. Uh, and what ends up, ends up happening then is that folks who really need uh, the mental health support get less of it as a result of that. So there's so many broad themes. And then another theme is uh, this question about whether our, so let me ask a really broad question. It's going to be too broad for you to address, but also Western Enlightenment thought says that we are all individuals. But most traditional cultures uh, from Africa and, and the Americas don't really have concepts of individuality or parts of the communities. And so one of the things I've always wondered about with therapy is that the individual is always getting treated, but there's not really a treatment of, the, say, the family, the family history, the multi-generational things. And you, you touched on that with the question of uh, epigenetic transference. Um, we're just discovering that historical trauma can actually be passed on um, at a biological level, which is pretty alarming. Um, I generally tend to be more concerned about the, the psychological side, because we do receive things, but the, uh, um, the individual uh, has their own you know, trajectory. I also just think it's so cool to see you doing this work, because as far as I know, complex trauma as a more nuanced uh, um, diagnosis than PTSD is only maybe 10 years old or something like that. So you know, it's not, not very old. PTSD has only gotten taken seriously quite a bit after uh, you know, Vietnam. And so um, this is new terrain. So I'm just really glad to see you doing that work, and I think more of it needs to be done. So those are like some passing thoughts. Um, and then some passing thoughts on, on your paper as well. So it's really exciting to see the work. Um, I, should, I should disclose that I'm, I'm ed editing with, with Stephen. Uh, uh, a collection of, of, of writings, and, and your pieces are both going to be in those collections. So this is a, an ongoing process of refining and, and getting this work out there, which we're really excited about. Um, so I think it's so cool that your work uses fashion, which is unusual, as a lens uh, to culture. And then also the, the photograph of evidence just jumps us back in time and shows us things. Um, there's so much there to look at. Um, couple suggestions uh, in terms of framing. Um, I thought about the concept of marinage, um, of, of the way in which people create maroon communities, essentially by escaping from white settler colonialism and all that violence. And I think at the coast of Nicaragua, there's elements of that. You talk about how it isn't Mayagna. Um, native community literally left the coastal strip and moved into the interior because there were threatening people there. So they just one of the main responses of indigenous communities was just to relocate and say, we just want to be left alone. Um, there's a book which I'll have to remember the title of it. Going way back to my undergrad days. It was a book that made a huge impact on me, and it covers this from an anthropology perspective, so you can cite it. 
by a guy named Bodley, B O D L A Y. And he talks about people essentially um, removing themselves from colonialism, fleeing and, uh, um, and relocating to other uh, spaces. Um, and then within the black tradition, you have uh, this concept of marinage and of um, throughout the Americas, basically liberated spaces that people create and where they're able to continue to have their own culture. Um, so then, you know, I also have questions about were there other missionaries besides these Moravians? Were, were there contending missionaries who showed up at that point and said, here's the way to be Christian, no, no, do it our way, you know, were, were, there, were there other denominations? Uh, or were they the only folks in town, so they were the one main way to do that? And, and even just connecting to some of those histories, uh, there's, there's such a long history. Theoretically, uh, you know, the big link to me would be Las Casas, who, you know, it's all the way back to the 1530s, but is essentially saying, let's not exterminate natives, let's uh, uh, let's convert them, you know, it's the conversion concept. So by the time you get to these folks, that's like a, what's it, trying to do the math here, 300 and some years old at that point, this tradition of forced conversion and so on. Um, but anyway, I just think it's so evocative, uh, the, the photography and what you see in that, and uh, to think about dress as a, as a space of colonization and, of, and decolonization, you know, uh, and reclaiming of identity. So with those, um, broad themes that I, you know, this, this is what I was struck by. Um, I don't know if y'all want to respond to any of that, but mainly I just want to open it up and have a little discussion. Anything that was helpful or interesting? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, in terms of other missionary groups, um, the Moravians definitely seem to be the most dominant because prior to them, a lot of the colonialism that was occurring was mainly um, economic in terms of the British, and it was mainly the British that were in that area um, really wanting to uh, take advantage of the natural resources there in the United States in terms of like um, banana plantations and fruit plantations and sugar cane and stuff like that. And so it didn't seem like the, the Spanish didn't, wasn't really, they weren't interested in that region. And so there wasn't really a Catholic presence. And however, I did talk to someone on Instagram whose father, she's Creole, and her um, her grandfather was Moravian, and then he started his own uh, Protestant church, I believe. So, um, Trying, and then he was the first one to kind of branch off, apparently. So I'm trying to get in touch with her without being like, you know, <laughs> a fangirl or harassing or something like that. <laughs> like, Tell me everything. <laughs> but um, I'm hoping maybe I could find more evidence of it, even just that little fact um, is kind of helpful. It's so interesting that the rest of the country would be largely under Catholic colonial auspices. Yeah. And here you have a Protestant situation, which is very different. Another thing is the when the colonizers decide, hey, we're not interested in this place, they tend not to build roads mm -hmm. and uh, uh, railways, and so there's no infrastructure, and those places tend to get what we call underdeveloped. But then actually, from the point of view of maintaining culture, that's always a positive because yeah. there's less people who can come there through tourism and other things. And so uh, in my own work in Kenya, uh, the community I, I researched uh, at the coast defeated the British militarily in 1917, and then were abandoned by all their, their plans. And so it means they have less folks admitted to university, um, less involvement in the economy, but then also give you the ability to maintain indigenous traditions a little bit more as well. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting um, two-sided coin, yeah. what that means being left out of quote unquote development of the nation, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. Let's open it up to our, our guests. Uh, any thoughts from our audience, questions? I actually have a, a question. I thought, um, like we talked about it earlier, but the the theme uh, between your your presentations was kind of dealing with uh, imagery and how imagery can impact people's cultures and how that can have an impact on individuals. And so, um, you know, would for Jasmine, would you think that seeing um, images of someone actively being colonized and that being archived? has an impact in the way that Angela was discussing. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, 
for me, I started this project as a way to kind of heal familial trauma. I'm estranged from my dad, who is um, afro Nicaraguan descent. We haven't spoken in really in like, um, God, since I was 18, I'm 32 now, that's math. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I was trying to uh, under unpack some of that and um, I really came to this research just out of curiosity of like what my heritage is and because uh, I'm not I didn't grow up um, with him so I wasn't familiar with the culture so it's like um, since I study fashion and dress and like I, I figured that would be like a good way for me to um, deal with that using something that I like to understand um, why he was dealing with his life decisions and also he had a lot of um, internalized racism as well which is not uncommon for a lot of uh, black Latinos uh, within like the society <laughs> um, and uh, so I was just trying to unpack that and then like found this research as well and then reading um, and seeing the images it was the first image I ever saw was a Moravian postcard which led me down this road and it labeled uh, Mayanga people as sumo heathen Indians and so that label of being a heathen and depicted in a very particular way and then they're just quotes throughout that talk about, oh, Creoles are very nice and polite, but the Negro from the West Indies is like noisy and boisterous and they're drunk and like all these, you know, primary resources that I was using were, you know, early, uh, or either coming from Moravians or like early 20th century anthropologists and it was just racist and painful to read and um, kind of like grapple, grapple with. So one of the things that's also interesting with your presentation in mind is the, the function of the way media is mm -hmm. used in terms of picture. And it's interesting because by the time they're showing people of a certain group in terms of a certain class, there's no variation in that. It's almost like they fit a certain profile. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the striking connections with that. So for example, when you see someone lynch, we know as African Americans, we have all types of different looks and variations, but by the time we see a lynching photo, it's always of some uh, African American male, not too tall, not too short, very dark skin complexion, and even the clothes typically, you're not seeing people that are in um, different types of clothes. It's usually clothes of someone who is a working class person, someone who's more industrial. And so to me, it's like asking the questions of, well, what type of messaging was this supposed to be sent to us that we brought into it even globally and even within the white community as we're looking at these photos in terms of what type of socialization is okay. It's okay because the bedrock of our community looks like this person that's also being lynched right here. And then you turn around and you see photos of people that were that were classified as heathens as well as people who converted to whatever the spiritual circumstances were at that time. But again, even looking at those photos, they all fell into a certain visual um, archetype of what that person looks like and so I find that to be interesting and in how the colorism aspect plays into it and then all these other moving pieces that add context to that as well. That's really deep. I mean both your presentations show us how violent the whole colonial process was but beyond just the military violence you have this cultural violence, this naming violence, this uh, dehumanization that takes place and the struggle to re reclaim and reassert one's humanity in those conditions is really intense. Um, I, I'm really struck by both the presentations because that piece is really deep. And I, I happen to be at a lecture on Thursday night uh, in the city that I organized. We had a guest speaker. And we were talking, I just want to share with you Sylvia Winter's theories. Um, and she's not very well known, and she's becoming much better than me. And she's going through the security to sort of recognizing she's one of the maybe most brilliant intellectuals of the 20th century. She's still alive and, and quite old now. Um, so it's Winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R. And she talks about the way in which the colonial process and the 
uh, Western colonization, really, of the rest of the world, starting in the 1490s, uh, really, um, creates this two categories of humans, the, the, the human and the non-human, essentially. And by being called the non-human or the non-norm, you have the norm and the non-norm, this is the category by which you're stripped of your humanity and seen as less human. And it's at a very deep intellectual level. And there's all these manifestations of that. Um, and so, um, you know, the most violent manifestations are things like these horrific lynchings, which prove the, uh, the you know, the literally manifest the dehumanization of the body and the attack and the violence towards the body. There's this flip side, though. In, in her thing, it's always relational. So there's a, a norm and a non-norm. The non-norm is, 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 is non-white folks, people who are being colonized, you know, people of African descent, people of indigenous descent. The, the norm is the white folks. And so your photo, and these photos are always haunting of the, of the white people attending a lynching, and smiling, and feeling casual, and looking into the camera, and being proud to record, hey, I'm here, and I'm hiding their faces. Um, and the fact that that's publicly celebrated is part of how whiteness and the norm of the dominant identity is constructed as well. And there's a side question which you and others don't uh, have any obligation to address, but comes up as a result of this work, which is, as this dehumanization of oppressed people happens, are the oppressors also dehumanized in a different way that we wouldn't equate? But what does it mean to feel entitled to lynch people or to attend a lynching or to show up in Nicaragua and say, these people are heathens. These people need to dress differently. You know, I have a superior idea and a superior culture. Um, what does that do to, you know, to create arrogance, entitlement, centeredness, uh, um, dominant identities, all those kinds of things? Uh, and is that colonizing people in a very different way? So that relationality, that we call it relationality, the self-other relationship. And Woodrick's theory is really deep on all of that. She's the one who really talks about, in the most profound way, what does this dehumanization process mean? And how do we create uh, a humanizing process again? And it's clear that the answer is going to have to be something beyond Western culture. Uh, and this is where uh, reconnecting with and reimbursing in non-Western cultures, African and indigenous cultures in particular, is probably our greatest path forward to get out of these dynamics because traditional cultures never really had those uh, violent self-other dichotomies. And so I, I just want to share that with you all. Um, are there other comments, questions, uh, uh, things you saw in the presentation you wanted to pull out and look at more closely, things you were struck by, if you want to share. I've actually never um, really thought about the different, the, the actual physical, the depictions of people in lynchings. So I thought that was really interesting because as much as you've studied it and talked about it, people have never really talked about this the specifics of like they're not too tall, they're not too short, they have on this kind of dress, they have that kind of thing. So I thought that was really interesting and Cause it's a something that I've, oh, yeah, and I've never seen that before. before. And it's it's a method to all that, but it's not enough language to to even couple with that. Right. And as you're seeing the the common threads of all that, it's a, it's a type of profile of man that they're always gearing towards. Right. But then how does that play out today in terms of profiling black people, profiling black women and black men? There, I think there's one lynching photo of a black woman, but the rest are all men. You know, right. And so that leads to another question because if they were inflicting that kind of violence on black women, you know they were doing that to black women, but yeah. where's the documentation that's equivalent to that? And then there are companies associated with these pictures that are being taken. And it's just like these companies get bought out and transition, you know, into other things. So it's like these people behind the cameras, they don't necessarily go anywhere, but they change into other things. And so being able to you know, talk about that in reference to there's a definite connection to it. Um, and I believe the World Health Organization, they also say when they talk about statistically, they view it as white and non-white in those realms too. What's the white and non-white? What do you mean? In terms of um, how they evaluate uh, people in reference to this people group of how they measure it against everybody else in terms of what they're looking at statistically. And I say that to say, um, when you're looking at all this information in terms of how African Americans are marginalized, you're, you're noticing that it doesn't necessarily apply overarchingly, but the way we go into treatment and some of the stories vary. So there are people that are able to afford outpatient services, but by the time you're looking for therapy in the community, if it costs $100, you're less likely to be consistent with it because it's compromising another bill that you're paying. So by the time that we need help, we're in more of a crisis situation 
to where we need all things in place, to where not only do we need the treatment, but we're needing housing, we're needing some type of medical intervention, all of those things, so we're hospitalized. So it's either one of the other in that regard. So I just wanted to touch on that as well. Can I ask about, uh, in the Nicaraguan context, there were things you touched on that I wanted to go deeper in, but one of the, the distinguishing uh, the Moravian categories was uh, based on hair, good hair, bad uh, hair. That was actually, so the mosquito group um, themselves when uh, there was like the division between the um, Sambo, which Sambo is uh, the English term that comes from the Spanish caste system, Zambo, which is um, an admixture, admixture between black and a black and indigenous person. Um, and then, uh, so they kind of divided into two groups. So the Tawita is a self a described term that the mosquito group gave themselves for being like pure because they recognize the difference, I guess. And, um, but it's interesting in the dynamics because the Sambo Mosquito were the larger group and became the more like politically engaged with the British and sort of exercised their um, power and created like a hierarchical like structure within the tribal group that kind of mirrored um, British uh, royal politics. Like there was a Mosquito King and the British at that time were like, okay, we'll give you that title, whatever, if that means we can, can continue to trade. Um, so it, there are a lot of, um, just because of all of the, the closeness of the communities, there's a lot of like, uh, I guess like micro categories in terms of uh, discussing race and how it functions there that I don't totally understand. I've never been there. I started this project like from, you know, my bed, <laughs> looking at pictures on the internet. And uh, it was, uh, I got for Google Books and eBay <laughs> and all of that because I don't know how I would have done this without it. Um, so there's a, a lot more that I, I need to understand, but I think, um, Edmund Gordon at, uh, he's at uh, UAT or University of Texas in Austin. He wrote about uh, the Creole community in the Mosquito Coast. And he has a, a pretty interesting, um, uh, I guess, uh, he wrote an interesting text about how it functions there. Yeah. And One of the things that happens is uh, when the, when the White settler colonialism happens, when colonization happens, there's a an acceptance of the uh, conceptual categories of the dominant group. So there was no, before British and Spanish or Nicaragua, nobody's thinking about dividing society based on good hair and bad hair, as though there is such a thing as good hair and bad hair. You know, in Spanish, it's actually the right term. Telemalo and Telemalo, which is really, you know, overtly racialized uh, and sort of there, but everybody's sort of like, oh, we just don't really think about that. This is built into our culture. Um, so there's these ways that racism gets embedded and is sort of normalized uh, and things like that. And yeah, and that's one of the things that I also thought was interesting that you brought up earlier in reference to the other side of how white people can also be traumatized as well as African Americans, because it's somewhat socialized and acceptable to talk about how African Americans are suffering openly, which I think is a good space for that. But when you look at a lynching photo, you're looking at the African Americans, but the larger concept is the European communities that are participating. So the same way we absorb that transference of traumatic events, so are the European people there as well. But it's normalized, so when you fast forward to today, and you're seeing people that are profiled, and killed, unjustified, and by the time someone's on the other side of that, that might not look like us as African Americans, it's a distance there. They might not have that same disconnect. But if it's another type of life to where it's an animal, it might be more of a closeness to that. So all of that is a socialization that's connected to something, but where does it come from? All right. And grounding it as you do, both of you do, grounding our present in these colonial pasts and the terminologies and the violence that that comes from helps us understand how this could even be happening in the present, you know, um, how uh, black lives could be um, uh, 
not considered to matter as much as the lives of, of, of dogs and, uh, and pets um, is a contradiction that some of us are seeing and calling out, and other folks are just not even noticing that's happening around us. So um, these are important paths that you, you both are charting to help us understand our present through these lenses. I think the past can really illuminate those things. So I think you both do a really good job in that. I'm getting the indication that we are out of time. <laughs> um, which is a <laughs> so nice way to start our, our morning uh, with this discussion. And I think there's a lot of unfinished uh, threads that we continue to discuss throughout the day. So thank you to our guests. Any announcements of what's next? Is there something here? We'll so we have um, from our archives. She'll be coming in to show some of the Thank you. 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 Thank you.